I can think uh, that you uh, think what's he doing here uh, talking about a minor should be in session on uh, on teaching. Um, well, I come to that uh, at the end of my yeah, my lecture why I'm here. Um, you all know these uh, two uh, two men, and uh, to, to some people these men are a threat to world peace, and other people think they should be nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And there is almost nothing in between between the one or the other. And they have a lot in common with this guy, and I'm not talking about uh, their hairstyles. Um, I'm talking uh, about the way they talk about people, and they talk to people, and they uh, don't talk with people. This last guy, um, that's, uh, it's Geert Heer Wilders, has been known as Geert Wilders in foreign countries. Um, and these guys are not binding people together, they divide people in us and them. And us is normally good, and them is always bad, or even. Um, Geert is in the Netherlands often mentioned as Uncle Geert. And Uncle Geert is, uh, you know, the, the, the drunk uncle at your birthday party who makes <laughs> appropriate jokes. Uh, but hey, it's Geert, it's family. Yeah? And uh, you know the inappropriate remarks, uh, these are not nice. Uh, and in some way they are understandable from some point of view. He, he represents uh, people who have lost faith in politics, uh, who are not highly educated, who are living in the not so nice suburbs, who belong to the lower social economic class, people who feel threatened by immigration, who feel threatened by criminality and so on. During the last elections, five weeks ago, this guy got 10% of the votes. One of each uh, in the Netherlands voted for this guy. And this guy is Thierry Baudet, and his name is French. And yes, he's a descendant of a Belgian, a Wallonian refugee. He's highly educated, wealthy, upper class, and he attracts highly educated people, wealthy people, successful people, and mostly young people, students from our universities. It's a member of his party who framed the term Bobbinger, Bobbinger in Dutch. And I'm very aware that the uh, N word is very offensive to most people. And I can assure you that the N word here is meant to be offensive. And if this guy is talking uh, about uh, second or third generation descendants of, of uh, uh, immigrants, he's referring to them as a homeopathic illusion of uh, Dutch ethnicity, and that's from his mouth as a, a, a descendant of, of an immigrant. Um, furthermore, his party is in favor of, uh, of an exit, because Brexit is such a good idea. Um, <laughs> one of the problems his party addresses are the high numbers uh, of refugees caused by the EU policy, and that's why they want an exit. Um, yeah, right, uh, high numbers of, uh, of refugees I looked it up, and in 2017 it took in 14,716 refugees. And to compare, between 1914 and 1918, the Dutch took in over a million Belgian refugees. Okay, it's also this guy who started to report on point for left wing uh, uh, lectures, so please. And why am I telling you, it is all about perspective, it's all about us and them, it's all about our people. Okay. Together with the universities of Winchester, Frankfurt, and Hessen Archaeology, we will start a minor on the archaeology of conflicts. And in this minor, we will focus on post industrial revolution conflicts. We see a growing interest in uh, World War I and World War II by young uh, people, by young students. And there's little focus in the, uh, in the interest. Some students, especially boys, uh, are fascinated by guns, uh, by ammunition, by uh, battlefield strategies, and by airplanes. And some are interested in relics in their own environment, like bunkers, lungs, etc. And for some, it's just about exciting, heroic stories. Um, but why shouldn't we uh, only study World War II and World War I? Because there are so many, many other interesting uh, things, like the Belgian Revolution in the Netherlands, the Revolution, um, our Civil War, uh, or the Troubles in Great Britain. Uh, or maybe Srebrenica in former Yugoslavia, or our defense lines against the communists. Defense lines of the 50s. Um, Phil Martyr initiated an international field school over nine years ago, and we had some favorite the Halifax, Halifax questions, this, this, this article about. Uh, that during this uh, excavation, we found out that there 
uh, was a very different attitude towards the problem at hand. English students uh, were excavating the site of their heroes. The daredevils who saved Great Britain from pure evil by heroic airstrikes. And then uh, there were Dutch students, and they were excavating the Cresson uh, of soldiers who freed their country. Um, Halifax is so known in the Netherlands as liberators. And the Germans, the German students, what were they doing? Excavating. Well, they were excavating a crash site of what was used to, uh, 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 to call in the past the terror bomber. And it's fascinating the way all these young professionals worked together uh, and had respect for these point of view and uh, uh, worked together with understanding for these different points of view. Well, something more about Halifax. The Halifax, uh, we uh, excavated two parts of the Nuremberg Raid, and from several locations in Great Britain, over 700 airplanes took part in this, uh, in this airstrike. And uh, it was thought to be a cloudy night, and you were probably aware of it. It, wasn't, uh, it was a clear night, and it uh, became well, one of the greatest nightmares of the Royal Air Force. Um, and there's our Halifax. Yeah, here's it going. Um, it was shot down by, uh, uh, by night, night fighting instead of by flak, which we found out by excavating it. Um, and the excavation, the historical research, the interviews with the inhabitants, and the descendants of the crew was very impressive and lent to a very emotional joint commemoration, which you can picture here. And in my opinion, uh, the field school led to a better understanding of different perspectives of the war. Uh, the different uh, uh, understanding of the different regulations and the understanding of the different interests in uh, research at this time of science. And it also brought the students in an uh, insight in the uh, understanding of, of, of the language of war, inviting people and asking them to be evil and, and, and good. Um, and last but not, mean, uh, not, not least, uh, it led to a design of a research method for press science. I think. In retrospective, it is interesting uh, what students who took part in this, uh, in this field school, it's only two weeks field school, uh, would think about these headlines in the British tabloid. In this article, it's mentioned that only 257 buildings in Nuremberg were uh, damaged. So, this picture of it. Uh, and only 75 enemies uh, were killed. And to what cost? We lost 106, uh, we lost 106 bombers and 545 men, young men, uh, many in their 20s, uh, were killed, right? Enemies, us, good, damn, bad, evil. So, this lovely old lady here, it's my neighbor, this was in the local newspaper, um, she's 84 years old, I believe. Um, she escaped three times an Allied airstrike. Um, cynically, she mentions uh, the target, the bridge over the river, I know the bridge over as the safest spot of her home, because the bridge was never damaged. Uh, but ten houses in her neighborhood were destroyed, a dozen of people were killed, including her neighbor, which what she saw as an eight year old. Um, enemy? She? Um, no, she's collateral damage. Yeah. Or at least her neighbor is collateral damage. And this fragile lady is up till today scared when an airplane appears in a clear sky um, at, at, at a low altitude. She an enemy? No. She them? Or us? Good? It's all just about people. People who happen to be at the wrong place in time. It's all about perspective. Well, why do we think internationalization for our, inst uh, for our students uh, is important? Well, an important aspect is, of course, internationalization of the labor market. But more important is the intercultural experience we give to these students. Students in general have seen more of the world as their teachers had when they were their age. Almost 100% of our students have been abroad. Well, it's not very easy from, from the Netherlands. But, um, it's a very small country. Um, they have visited uh, a hotel in a resort in Greece, in a resort in Spain, in a resort in Turkey or whatsoever, had their, in their hotel a continental breakfast, uh, in the evening, a celebrated TJ uh, enjoyed the favorite breezes and beers and ordered an Uber to go back to their hotel. They did everything according to their own Facebook poll. The world is only one click away, but an intercultural experience is not. 
Therefore, you have to speak with each other and to work with each other. An interesting question is which students take part in uh, education abroad? Well, it are not the best, you have mainly the masters who go abroad. It are not the students, mainly not the students from the University of Applied Sciences, but from universities. And uh, it are not the students with low social economic status, but mostly with high economic or social economic status. For the Netherlands, 12% of the uh, students, of all students from university, masters, bachelors, uh, university of applied sciences, go for a uh, take part in education program abroad. It's not about how long it is, even if it's just one, uh, one week. 29% would like to go, but doesn't go. And it's even worse when you find it for uh, uh, participation of students in the technical domain of universities of applied sciences. It's where the archaeological, our archaeological department is part of uh, a technical, it's part of the technical domain. Um, it's only one to two percent who take part in education abroad. And if we take into account also the, uh, the, the internships, then it's 12 to 14 percent of the students who uh, go abroad. And the top three of obstacles mentioned by these students are their finances, business to relatives, and house, housing. Therefore, we think uh, that this to minor is a solution, not a solution, but a solution. Uh, we propose uh, a minor uh, where students of these three different nationalities work together in international projects. They can work on these uh, uh, projects from within their own educational institute. And uh, they are also graded in their own uh, educational institute. Well, this is the minor, and I think you can't read it from the, the back. But this is the minor we, uh, we designed, and we received a grant for it to be evaluated by the other methods organization for scientific research. Um, it consists of three MOOCs, uh, archaeological research of conflict sites, of course, on meta theory and practice, Historic sources, a course on the critical use of historic sources, and conflict heritage, a course in the the public with respect to different points of view, regulation, and law. Furthermore, there is an uh, individual assignment, a group research project, and an international field school part of the, uh, of the mine. <coughs> well, now it comes. You all have presented some interesting research on this topic. And what we are looking for are uh, vlogs or footage or whatever uh, what you have available for this course, Archaeological Research of Conflict Science. So if you are willing to share this, I would be very glad to have my colleagues with me. Um, also, if you have an interesting research, interesting, yeah, interesting research project, um, and you think if your research project would fit in this uh, digital mine, um, I, I would like it when you would contact me. Now, what does a project have to look like? Well, there have to be historical sources, maybe oral. It has to be a project which has uh, physical features or finds, since we are dealing with archaeology. Um, the research material has to be uh, online, if possible, where possible, not everything is online, but mainly online. And if possible, um, uh, we want. Um, Sites with multinational aspect. Um, so I'm coming back to my lovely neighbor. Um, she's pointing at a bullet hole in her doorstep. And it's a type of project which could be uh, uh, useful. Why were they shooting at her? Uh, well, it's very easy. It was a railway bridge over uh, the River Rhine. And it was the transport route for these rockets, the V2 rockets, which were assembled uh, at station of uh, Leiden Central, and then were transported over the bridge towards the lost launching site. There are all kinds of traces visible in the area. Photographs are available, digital available. Uh, that's the house where she lived. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, there you see some uh, defense lines, and there's some flag just outside this, uh, this picture. 
And these are the launching sites and the locations where you can see all kinds of traces in uh, the nearby city of uh, Wassenaar and uh, The Hague. So, we intend to start this uh, uh, minor in 2020. We are now preparing courses and we are preparing all the video material and footage. So, if you have anything and if you want to participate uh, in, 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 uh, in the project, I would often let us participate in the project. I would really be very glad. Um, this is another uh, type of site, it's the uh, hijacking of, uh, of a train by a former in inhabitants in the 70s in the Netherlands, former inhabitants of the Moluccan Islands in Indonesia, and also this site could be a very good spot to, to use for uh, a research. Because there are multi uh, outputs, uh, all the, uh, the necessary uh, ingredients are, are there. Um, if you are willing to participate, you can reach me at this email address. And on behalf of my, uh, my colleagues, Phil, Rudiger, Udo, Christoph, Pim, Ronald, Pim, uh, Ronald, uh, Pim is here, Ron is here, um, uh, Ruud, and Marat, uh, thank you for listening.